Sir George Fishnitch, thanks very much for joining me today. Yeah, all right, nice meeting you, Jake. Yeah, and um, it's great to be here at, at Villa Maria Estate. It's a pretty amazing place. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, we're uh, having a lot of fun here. We have a lot of weddings and yeah. functions, corporate events, as well as um, it's a very sophisticated winery. Yeah. And uh, we've got a very lively lunchtime restaurant there. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Um, Umpfa is all about inspiring people to achieve extraordinary things. So, growing up, who and what has inspired you in your life? Uh, well, it's quite funny. My, my parents were Croatian and um, they came out sort of reasonably late in life. My father was um, 29, 30. He didn't speak English and he had no money, so he went gum digging. And, um, but as he saved a little bit of money, he, he was very proud to put my oldest brother through law school. And um, it was not so much my brother who wanted to be a lawyer, but that was a point of pride. Law was the thing to do then. Yep. I was the second brother, so he said, you have to have a trade, so a carpenter and joiner, you can build your own house. <laughs> and so, but I, I used to, um, my parents always, being Croatian, had wine with every meal, and I used to visit out the Henderson Valley, all the um, Croatian winemakers out there, and back in that time, you know, Cro Croatia winemakers were really the, the Jukic's, the Silax, the Babic's, the Dalaguts were all Croatian, they, they were very much early pioneers in the industry. So I got quite friendly with them and I used to walk through the vineyards and think this is um, what I want to do. And um, But I had to do a 10,000 hour or five year apprenticeship. So I managed to um, do that in just under four years by um, by getting a trade certificate and school set and a bit of overtime. And then I, I sort of decided to change careers and uh, get into wine. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you were always obviously so passionate about it from a young age, mm. obviously at, starting at 21, mm. um, growing growing on one hectare of land and mm. on a two hectare bit of land that you obviously um, leased from your father. So I mean, back then in 1961, what was, what was the industry like compared to today? It must have been pretty different. Well, it's funny, the, I think the industry had more respect in the 18th century. It was, you know, the mission, just a few old wineries, but back then it was just after the, um, I suppose in the early days, um, it had la very lack of respect. Most um, Kiwis were, you know, beer drinkers. Okay. You've you, you probably heard of a six o'clock swill. Yeah. And um, the New Zealand wine had very little respect. And what wine we did make, well, 95 percent of it was port, sweet port, and sweet sherry, okay. and liqueurs like cherry brandy. So, sort of wines like the dry reds and things like that were in the infancy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I can imagine starting out, you must have had pretty huge determination to succeed against the bigger wineries already out there and the competitive spirit that was already going on. Yeah, well, well it was quite funny. I suppose when I look back, um, I sort of basically changed careers quite dramatically and I just made the decision I'm going to get into wine without knowing a whole lot <laughs> about um, how I was going to go about it. Uh, or, and. Uh, because you like that and then you sort of, at that stage I thought, boy, if I could, uh, we had a, a hectare and I brought contract gra grapes, I was one of the first contract buyers from Tikawara, um, but I thought if I could have 10 acres of Chardonnay, 10 acres of Cabernet and 10 acres of Middle Fergo, that would be an ideal, beautiful, sort of medium-sized company. Yeah. And 30 acres actually then would have been a, a medium size. that probably now to have a it would be equivalent to having 500 acres today. <laughs> yeah. Quite funny how you know the volume of wine was so so small. Yeah, yeah, uh, 30 yeah. acres was considered you know, quite ambitious. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I guess differentiating yourself from what was already out there was pretty important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and I read a story that in uh, 1961 on, on your honeymoon you stopped over at the Tokoroa wine shop to drop some, some wine off. I mean, you obviously loved it as well, didn't you? You must have just thrived on what you did. Uh, well, yes, actually, 61 was quite important. Started with Villa Maria, started making wine, um, got married. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, Busy, yeah, and, right? um, I think actually it was a bit of a joke. <laughs> on your honeymoon you're stopping to deliver wine. But I thought it was a logical thing to do. We're driving to um, Taupo. Yeah. And, um, I didn't have much money, so you know, I think there's about five cases on the boot. Yeah. So I did that, but anyhow, my wife's still married to me, and we've got sort of three children and six six grandchildren. Yeah. So um, the marriage did survive. Yeah. <laughs> survive. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. 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 And today, I mean, over 50 years, over 50 years later from when when starting uh, Villa yeah. Maria, I mean, obviously still in the family as mm. such. So, what has been the advantages of keeping the business family owned? 
Uh, well, my daughter's the chairperson now, and, and I've got a, a nephew that's um, one of our directors. But I, I think being family owned, um, you can make better quality, you can make long term decisions. And um, what I mean by that, like, um, I, I do find um, a lot of people come to me that have worked in corporates and they say, um, how much uh, reserve wine do we have to make? What was our budget this year? And I say, well, it depends on the vintage. If it's a good vintage, <laughs> we'll make, you know, make as much as you can. If it's a bad vintage, don't make any. You know, we'll just make commercial wine because, you know, you do have different tiers of wine. And they say, shivers, um, we have to, we've always told we've got to make, say, a, you know, a thousand cases. doesn't matter what it's like. And I always found that strange because um, we've pretty well got a gold medal for just about every reserve wine we've ever made. Yeah. We have. And, um, but there's years we just don't make wine. So, so uh, possibly if you're a public company, you've got shareholders that want, want profit or they want to yeah. see things a certain way, and that doesn't sort of quite, I think it's easier to make quality wine when you're, um, and good long term decisions when you're a family company. Yeah. yeah, yeah, true. Okay. And, but was it a bit of a challenge in those early days to grow it as such without maybe having external international investment or things like that? Was that hard work? Uh, well, yes, I did. Um, I did change banks a few times. <laughs> um, I do find that when you're growing, um, people sort of do sort of see you as a small wine company. Yeah. And at one stage, I, I did. I needed more grapes. You know, I was always short of grapes, so um, I decided to. Um, I was actually buying grapes from the Vidals, which is a family in um, North Hawkes Bay, okay. Vidal family, and um, anyhow, yeah, they they were wanted to retire and I was going through a few problems, so they offered the winery to me. And I went to the bank and said, this, this fulfills my dream, it'll give me you know, a presence in Hawke's Bay, it'll yeah. give me um, the grapes I want. And the guy said, you can't afford it, you know, um, there's no way you can do it. So I just went to another bank, another bank sort of, you know, you got more of an entrepreneurial bank manager, yeah. saw my vision, what have you, and I got the funding. So um, you do find, though, that you don't take no for an answer. There was yeah. no way I was going to be stopped by one bank manager. Yeah, okay. So, so I just changed banks. And yeah. I probably had to do that a few times in my early career. Okay. But it w was very, very hard. And um, yeah. and when you get big, we, we had a big um, problem in 80, 1985, nearly 30 years ago, when Briley's, um, the big Briley's finance company got in the wine industry. Yeah. And they, they felt there was too many medium to size, large size wine companies that should be like breweries, you know, DB Lion, two okay. breweries, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two wine companies. So they started with a price war and um, sold at half price. And I lost, pretty well lost all my equity and went to receivership. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was, um, you know, the sort of problems you get. But the point was I recovered. Yeah, 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 yeah. And not many people recover from receivership. Once you're under receivership, um, you, you, you know, a lot of people, you, you go under. Um, I was probably determined um, to, and de determined to get out of it, and we did, did actually. Um, okay. Yeah. So they started sort of doing mergers and acquisitions and trying to create one big brand, is yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So obviously, just going back to what you're saying about the bank managers and stuff, obviously huge lessons learned around uh, that you would probably pass on to people around um, just sticking at it and trying different people and building relationships. Oh and, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I find now, I mean, obviously it's far more sophisticated. You've got to, you know know what your equity is and you've got to you know, have all your uh, covenants covered and what have you and I mean I suppose in some ways uh, as a company we are very strict about um, you know, doing all that type of thing so we don't have that type of problem now um, but um, again in the early days you know you're, you're perceived as a small chap you can't you can't grow stay where you are type thing yeah. so it's quite funny and you've got to break out of that sort of uh, system now. Yeah. Okay. And just talking about, um, I guess, that growth, um, in terms of continuous improvement and innovations, uh, within the winery uh, business, is that, is that pretty important? Uh, yes, yeah, it's funny, um, I mean, I was fortunate to win the Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year about probably eight or nine years ago now, yeah. and um, I didn't enter it actually, my staff actually got behind me, <laughs> did all the work and made me enter and I ended up winning it, mm -hmm. and subsequently... Um, going to Monte Carlo, um, you know, it was a great award to get in, so yeah, young yeah. do a fantastic job and you learn a lot about your business, but people said, oh, you're an entrepreneur, you know, and I thought, well, I, 
didn't know anything about what an entrepreneur yeah. really was, but I think it's actually um, the fact that I suppose I've always had an enormous passion for wine, and um, to make good wine you need good grapes, and I suppose I, I, so the first thing I did was um, I changed the grape system, grape, grape buying, to, to a certain extent all our growers were, had one price, one quality level, okay. and we decided we wanted to make more top end wine as well. Yep. So we, we said to our growers, look, um, we're going to pay you so much per um, tonne yeah, yeah, at yeah. Uh, a certain tonnage, but we'll pay you a different price for high quality and we'll penalise you <laughs> if you over crop. Yeah. And that, that took a lot of, um, to get that sort of system going, took, mm. took a lot of, a lot of, lot of um, I suppose, um, guts really, both yeah. from myself and my viticulturist to try and yeah. teach people this is the way to go in the future. So I find really in some ways that my, I suppose my passion made me do things um, and the fact I'm, I'm pretty fussy about quality and I, I, I did find back in the probably 80s it was just so much corked wine, you know, about 8% of all wine was corked okay. and so I, I yeah. went, um, I wasn't the first to go into screw caps but I was the first to go global worldwide yeah. cork free zone okay. and um, and we um, so we went at 100% screw caps, mm. and we got a huge amount of abuse about that problems. Mm. But um, I read an e I read a um, thing that you said before about somebody who said uh, that um, they 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 wouldn't be able to buy wine anymore because their <laughs> wife uh, their wife didn't used to know how to take the cork off, oh, yes, and yeah, now yeah. she had learned how to unscrew it. So by the time the husband got home, she already drank in the oh, bottle and yeah. couldn't cook him dinner anymore. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we had a lot of. Um, yeah. We have quite a little bit of humour in it, yeah. but actually, funny enough, in the UK, the UK's got a lot of masters of wine, and um, when I, I actually went over to the UK and we printed about thousands of t-shirts, you know, <coughs> you know, <coughs> don't drink sort of bad wine, you know, drink yeah. screw cap wine, and things like that, and um, also addressed a big conference there of a trade, and there was 300 people there. And I, I lucky I got about a 15 minute speaking segment, yeah. made a little video. And I asked how many people sort of agreed with uh, screw caps, and uh, it was something like 65 to 70% thought that uh, corks was the only way to go, screw caps yeah. were bad yeah. <laughs> at the start. But then it's funny how things happen. Um, the day before, Hugh Johnson, um, he's a famous uh, journalist, and he's written about 60 books online. And um, he's seen as a wine expert, and well, and seen as a sort of person really understood all the French wines of Burgundy's or Bordeaux's. And he came out with a little pocketbook saying, imagine if our ancestors, something, something like, had screw caps a hundred years ago, imagine all the fantastic wine we'd be able to be yeah. drinking today. And it was just one of those things I heard about it the previous afternoon. And we, we, we found a book that had just come out of print, and it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. And we just, we, I mean, we had agents over there. We basically did everything to try and get hold of that book, and we finally got it, great expense, flown into London and um, taxied into this conference. And I was able to read from that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> it's funny how I think you've got to, I think everybody gets lucky breaks, but you've got to be able to take advantage of them. So um, mm -hmm. that actually probably ended up converted probably another 20% of the people to okay. start thinking about screw caps. Screw caps yeah. And so the UK started off pretty well, but in America we um, we said to our agents, if you want to buy Villa Maria wine now, you have to accept screw caps. And they incredibly very did very reluctantly, and we got delisted within two months from 30, 30 seafood restaurants, okay. which is a big loss of business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a year later we got back in. Okay. So nice. I think in some ways, um, so when I think about it, I suppose it's just like, you know, if you're passionate about something, yeah. you'll turn, you know, you gotta, you'll turn things upside down yeah, to, yeah. to make it happen and to me. And I guess you, oh sorry. Yeah, well, screw caps are now 90, probably 97% of the New Zealand mine industry. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not far short of 100%. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I guess you talk about, and we're talking about innovation obviously both in terms of products, such mm. as changing from corks yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, screw caps, yeah. but also in terms of process, as you are talking about before. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. obviously, um, Villa Maria as a, as a company is pretty agile and willing mm. to change what's, what's mm -hmm. going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we talked before about, obviously, uh, the struggles that you sort of went through with, uh, um, in particular with 
um, the receivership um, mm. back in the was it in the mid eighties. Mm. Um, in terms of business, uh, when you look back, what do you think some of the other struggles were that, that you might have gone through in business that you think has influenced what what the company's become today or what you've become as a business person? <coughs> well. Um I suppose one thing, the wine industry is probably recognised as a very volatile industry. Um, it's actually, it's got a high profile. So in a sort of sense, you do get, um, you know, doctors, lawyers, uh, <laughs> you know, millionaires, <laughs> all sorts of people buy little boutique wine companies to make their own wine. So like in New Zealand now, there's over 700 wine companies in New Zealand and probably about 2,000 in Australia. There's millions around the world, so mm. so in a sense, it's it's quite competitive. Um, yeah. uh, you know, in terms of the amount of um, pressure on marketing mm. and establishing a brand, and as you get bigger, um, um, people don't like big, but even though we're making better quality, they they sort of see small as possibly being better quality, okay. <coughs> which is actually quite false because in a sense. Um, you know, we, we actually have done contract wine making and <laughs> we know what <coughs> goes into some of those labels. Yeah. Um, uh, but people sort of, so, but you're up against that, you know, and yeah. again, when, when you grow, you get into, um, for instance, you've you got to really get into supermarkets and chain mm -hmm. stores. Mm -hmm. And then again, restaurants. So restaurants don't want to know you because they see that as, um, um, as a thing people are going to think they're r ripping them off. Okay. The truth is, funny enough, that um, probably the great majority of restaurant customers want to have brands they can trust yeah. and um, so quite often a lot of people complain the fact they don't know the wines in restaurants but it's a funny thing you're always sort of competing with these false impressions about things mm -hmm. and um, perceptions, that people yeah, have perceptions that yeah, yeah. as you're growing you know so even though you might have the best wine in the world yeah. you have to put up with um, people think oh this is a tiny little thing it only makes a thousand cases it must be good the reality is that you learn, you keep on learning, you know, because we've got probably a dozen winemakers, we mm. have seminars, mm. we taste, we blend, we research, yeah, all exactly. passionate. Yeah. So you, you do get to a far high level of quality if you're yeah. a private family company and that's your purpose and a one man band that um, hasn't got all that, that ability to yeah. sort of research and taste yeah. and think and, you know. And, and live, live the whole thing, yeah. yeah. And, and what's been the difference between um, just talking about, say, smaller wine companies as opposed to bigger ones. I mean, one thing I personally respect a lot about Villa Maria is that it's not just an awesome wine company, it's mm. also a great business. Mm. So um, what have been the differences in terms of running this business um, from a business perspective that you think has differentiated Villa Maria? Uh, well, I think a lot of our winemakers um, um, like the idea that we're basically quality orientated and I think what, what, when I suppose getting into business in 1979 <laughs> um, we decided, it's funny enough, 79 to date is 6 and we won, we did a very good showing at um, the Wine Awards, the Major Wine Awards which is now the New Zealand Wine Awards, okay. it used to be Trade yeah. and Enterprise. We won more gold medals and silver medals than any other wine company yeah. and, um, and we are still relatively small then. Um, yeah, medium size. So we made we decided to make a commitment that this is going to be our life going on. Once we're going to just focus on quality, we're not going to grow too big. And um, and I think that has means that we've attracted very good winemakers. Okay. We started off actually in '79 by advertising globally for um, two winemakers, a, a, a chief winemaker and a. Oh, sorry, and two, two assistant two assistant winemakers. One of them sort of came to chief. Okay. <coughs> I interviewed about sixty people in Australia, and New Zealand, and um, and I ended up with nobody. And then I got a late interview, and I re you know, probably rejected about fifty more than fifty people. And then I got what I thought was a guy that was really passionate about wine, had all the academic qualifications. So it was that was part of a plan. It was actually a planned thing to get top winemakers. And then also the guy had to be a, a teacher trainer, so yep. the guy I did employ, Kim Milne, he, he was very good at te teaching other people. Mm -hmm. So probably over the last um, 79, that's about 35 years ago, we've been quite highly recognised for being a training school for New Zealand winemakers. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and okay. most of our winemakers um, 
Yeah, do do ten years stint or fifteen years stint, although Gordon Russ has been with us thirty years. Yes, but if I make a, not as a chief wine maker, but half half that time I've been chief wine maker. So we've almost created the, a culture that Billamere is where you it's a little almost like a university. You yeah. learn you, you learn how to make wine. Uh, you're encouraged to if you get an opportunity, take it and we encourage people to travel the world. Um, a lot of our winemakers do tend to stay, so yeah. if you're if you're you've come in your bright <laughs> after about five or six years you think that guy's not leaving. So yeah, a lot of our winemakers move on. But it's interesting, a lot of journalists come over from from overseas and they go around the whole of New Zealand and say, Trust everywhere we go. There's somebody that's been through the what they call the Villa Maria training school. Okay. And um, very cool. Which yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think and that's quite quite good. It gives us the ability to, you know, um, make make better wine and yeah. um, we've got all these people of friends and they all get together and mm -hmm. they swap stories and yeah. you know, teach each other. So yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when looking back, I mean, now from being a passionately owned family company to having, uh, I guess, 950 hectares of, of mm -hmm. winery land between um, Auckland and Marlborough, mm -hmm. um, to, I mean, having diversification to other wineries from, I guess, Tiawa to Esk Valley, and mm -hmm. obviously from winning um, or, or getting the bio growth status being the first New Zealand winery in 2009. What are you most proud of when you look back over your whole career? It's funny, well, I've, I've been quite fortunate in that, that I've had a lot of accolades from the, um, I suppose in some ways, um, from the sort of knighthood to the Ernest and Young and then the, um, I won the um, Kia, I won the Kia Award, you know, Kiwi, um, Kiwi um, people abroad, um, yep. I was sort of somehow got involved in that. Okay. And then um, a couple of years ago I won the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Wine Spirit Competition yeah. and I was a third person. so. Well, that was yeah, quite good. Yeah. And we've won sort of awards at Wine Spectator, which is the main magazine in America. So we've had a lot of success in those areas. Yeah. But funny enough, about in the 80s, um, Hawke's Bay had uh, an award for, um, it was a sort of a inaugural award for the person that had done the most for the Hawke's Bay wine industry, yeah. wine grape industry. And um, that was voted by the uh, wine makers and viticulturists in Hawke's Bay, and I won that award. That was quite important when you get something just from your peers. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a very competitive field, and there was a lot of well-known wine makers down there. So I always sort of almost some ways away to find that that award actually from your peers, um, just voting you the person made the most contribution to the Hawke's Bay wine okay. industry. I found that was. Um, I quite like that one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I guess looking into the future now, what's next for you personally and for Bill Maria as a company? Um, are you much of the same? We got some new plans and new things to get into? Or? Um, well, I think actually when you're in, it's an exciting business. The wine yeah. industry is something that, um, you know, you, you start from the land, you're actually looking at land, and um, is it clay or is it, um, yeah, river gravel, you know, um, and, uh, What's uh, you're looking at climate, temperature, um, rainfall. So you are basically a farmer, <laughs> and then you you might say you're a grower, then you you plant those vineyards, grow your grapes, and so you yeah you know, you're you're part of the um, horticulture horticulture you might say, and then from there you're making wine. So that's half art, half science. <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah. You're a sort of a you know, so it's quite funny. And then you you go through to production. It's a factory. You got to bottle it cap it, label it, yep. and then you've got to market it, <laughs> do the marketing and selling, and then you know, now we're a major exporter. And um, we have, um, you know, sort of in the group we have three restaurants, mm. and uh, we do weddings um, both here in Hawke's Bay. Okay. Um, we've got quite a few major conferences. Um, mm. <coughs> in the next few weeks we have a Better By Design conference, which is an international yep. conference. Uh, and um, so it's such a complete sort of lifestyle, you know, you, you Part of you're part of everything, yeah. and obviously, um, and I think it, you know. So I, I really enjoy the industry, and it, yeah. I've, you know, I've travelled to selling wine now, and spoken to people in China, Russia, you know, states, UK. Yeah. So it does, it, and they look, all our wine makers travel a lot and go promoting wine. Okay. So yeah, so it's a great lifestyle. So my my thing is, um, I'm still CEO. Yep. Um, my daughter's a chair, Karen's a chairperson, but. I, I, I probably we're just I'm really building up a, 
people that can take um, take over, you know, the senior leadership team, and uh, focusing more on leadership skills and um, how how you sort of have succession planning. Yeah. And and that a lot of people say with succession planning is um, who takes your job. I see it a little bit differently. It's um, <coughs> you've got to have a good board of directors, which yeah. we have uh, different skills, um, but you've also got to make sure you've got a leadership team where there are a number of people there that eventually have got the capability of running a company and there's always going to be a standout leader and um, so in some ways I'm, I'm probably looking more at the future now yeah, yeah. and becoming more of a brand ambassador. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic and we've just got a few quick fire questions to finish off. Yeah. Um, so George, as someone who's built this company up to be yeah. one of New Zealand's most yeah. respected and, and obviously in the world as well, I mean, in terms of a winery, and also with 350 staff, mm. wines in 60 countries, if you were to summarise what you think it takes to be a business person or an entrepreneur, what would you say? I think you've got to have a passion, passion for what you're going to do. Yeah. You know, and uh, basically I think, um, and it's almost, I, I look for that also in my leadership team, um, you've got to have enthusiasm, because mm. uh, that's important. Um, and I think you've got to be prepared to take risks. Okay. Yeah. I, I, mind you, when you get into ownership, yeah, I suppose the, the risk taking has got something that you're always going to get. Uh, you've got to be able to cope with stress, yeah. because uh, if you are running your own business and you've got all the responsibility, you ha you've got to be able to take, you know, to be able to cope with, with um, stress. That's quite important. And um, Okay, and, and I guess in summary, your sort of top three bits of advice for starting out entrepreneurs, what would you say to them? Uh, if you're going to start as an entrepreneur again, you've got to be very passionate about um, what you're going to do. Yeah. And, and you've got to be able to you know, really love it. I think you, you have to um, be prepared to work hard mm. uh, and uh, you've got to be able to accept the fact um, that every now and again you'll get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to accept failure. Uh, you got to have a. Uh, you basically got to be able to cope with stress. That's very, very important. And um, yeah, and I think uh, essentially, um, I always sort of feel um, if you're going to be an entrepreneur. You have got to surround yourself with people that maybe are, are got more intelligent or better than you. Yep. And like that, you keep growing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. And um, in terms of winemaking specifically, um, what what do you say to young winemakers out there? Is it important to go out and and get qualifications, or is the passion more important? Um, actually, funny enough, when I started winemaking in New Zealand, there's only one qualified winemaker in all of New Zealand, so everybody just um, learnt from the ground up. But today, it is very sophisticated. You do need a university education. Okay. Um, but we do get, um, I, I interview lots of winemakers. Sometimes you do get what I call academic winemakers. Yeah. They, they know everything about everything, but um, I'm, I'm looking for the passion, so one of our tests with a winemaker is. Bring me half a dozen bottles of wine that you've made that you're proud of, and um, and quite often um, then you sit there and you taste the wine with them, and uh, you just you've got to feel the passion, the enthusiasm, yeah. and so in the end I'd say it's um, it's probably 50% education, intelligence, understanding the chemistry of wine, yeah. and prepared to learn and keep learning and reading, but the other thing is that feeling, that passion, that enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, it's the artist side that yeah, um, yeah. makes the great winemakers, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. And um, what, what would the 16-year-old boy you were think of the man you've become today? Completely, totally surprised. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I ever saw myself as being in business and uh, I probably I probably saw myself as possibly, um, you know, starting to make a bit of wine. I was starting to, you know, because I was visiting these people and um, if I had my time again I probably wouldn't have done building. Although it has been very handy because I've used my building experience to build, you know, um, build quite a few wineries or at least understand what's happening. Yeah. But um, no, I'd probably be very surprised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and if you could look at that 16 year old uh, and give him a bit of advice, is there something in particular you would want to say? Um, well, <laughs> actually, it's the first time I've been asked that question, yeah. I think, you know, I think in a funny sort of way, There'd be a whole lot of things that you, the knowledge I've got now, if I started again, a lot of things I'd do differently. But it doesn't work that way, because yeah. you learn through making a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And I've done a lot of, I've had made a lot of mistakes and done a lot of things wrong, but luckily I've done more um, right things than wrong things, and uh, 
And I have, so I have actually had a knack of sort of surrounding myself with very good people mm. and uh, motivating them and getting them enthusiastic, enthusiastic about the company and that's, that's very important when you're going to grow a company. You've got to have those people around you because although you've got nice bricks and mortar and lovely buildings, it's actually the, the staff and the people that really actually make the company out. Yeah. Brilliant. So just to finish off, I mean, Sir George Fasonic, it's an amazing story and I think um, our viewers will get a lot of inspiration from it. So to finish off, um, can you look down this camera here Minus. and uh, summarise, I mean, what are your wise words for the people of New Zealand? Oh, well, I think you've got to live life to the full. Work, you know, um, I think it's important to work hard, play hard, um, drink good wine and live life to the full. And always I uh, respect your, your fellow your fellow sort of neighbours and everything, you know, respect is a very important thing, yeah. Great, you said just for such, thanks so much. Okay. Yes, appreciate it. Right, yeah.